Hi, everybody. Um, really excited to welcome you all today uh, for a panel that I've been wanting to do for a number of months now and have assembled a really kind of extraordinary group of people to come talk to us. Um, the, the topic of digital public infrastructure is one that has begun to kind of emerge more and more in the last uh, few months. And in fact, uh, just this week, the G20 had 19 of its 20 members all approve a joint statement around the importance and significance of digital public infrastructure. So there's clearly the kind of growing attention from governments about this. So what I want to do today is I'm going to just first talk a little bit about what we mean by that term. Um, and then we have uh, three panelists um, who each bring an enormous amount of the table. So um, Priscilla um, was used to work for uh, the National Bank in Brazil and was part <coughs> of the team that helped launch PIX, which is a payment platform that's been used by um, uh, over 100 million people in Brazil. Um, uh, Anir is the, uh, is, helps run um, ATY, which is the digital service team in Bangladesh. Um, they've launched a number of kind of infrastructure type components, but particularly Anir, I'm, I'm particularly interested in data sharing from you or data exchange, but they've launched several. And then um, Matthew um, is from Jamaica, although he currently lives in New York. And he ran a civil society um, um, kind of coalition that responded to Jamaica's digital ID law, which was a prelude to, to Jamaica launching its digital ID. Um, so we have three people who are really coming to this from different dire um, directions, but all like deeply, deeply experienced. Um, so first, let me just talk a little bit about digital public infrastructure. What, what do we mean by this? So, I think we're at this very interesting moment right now where if you'd ask people what digital infrastructure was 20 years ago, people would have talked about like the pipes. They would have said, oh yeah, like this is like laying cables, this is about um, getting cell phone towers up, just like can we even like move bits around. Um, that problem for many parts of the world, not at all, but in many parts of the world is, is, is increasingly solved or solved. And I think people see line of sight with kind of further connectivity coming where the odds of pretty much everybody having connectivity on the planet is probably within sight of us. And so now the conversation is kind of moving, kind of, if you will, up the stack, which is if you have connectivity, now what? And now there's kind of, a, there's a recognition that there's things that you need to be able to do online that are gonna be effectively essential for you to be a functioning member of society and of markets in a digital era. So do you have some form of identification that allows you to authenticate into services online, not just in person, but online, so you can receive government benefits or sign up or engage with private, private players? Um, now, Nanella Kenny sometimes talks about like, if you don't have identity rights, you can't have property rights. So this notion of having some form of ID becomes really, really critical. And it probably would be ideal if that ID functioned in a kind of digital means. The second is, is uh, that would make, allow you to get government services, but you're not gonna go very far if you can't receive or send payments. So what does some sort of payment infrastructure looks like? Now in the way, like in the uh, mature markets, a lot of places will think about that as a solved problem because you're like, oh, well, we have Visa or MasterCard who are effectively charging a 2.5% rent on every transaction that everybody is doing because often most vendors are required to charge that amount. They're not allowed to only charge it to people who use Visa and MasterCard. So we're paying this huge rent to these people who are prov provisioning what is effectively a payments infrastructure. But in many parts of the world, um, Visa, MasterCard are not accessible to many people. Credit markets don't work for them. So what does it look like to move people off of paying in cash physically to paying cash digitally when credit isn't gonna be the driver of that? And now we start thinking about a kind of different form of infrastructure, which is what has happened in Brazil with PIX and, and, and some of the work that Priscilla has done so incredibly exciting. And then on top of that is, what does it look like to do some sort of payment, uh, d data exchange? So um, this could be just restricted with inside government. So uh, if I give one ministry a piece of information, why do five other ministries have to collect the exact same piece of information? Couldn't there be some smarter way for them to share that, but in ways that are sensitive to privacy and prevent some sort of kind of surveillance that we'd be uncomfortable with? Um, but one could also imagine that more ambitiously, which is what does it look like to exchange data between private entities, between the government, between colleagues, in ways that are kind of secure and safe to me. And you could start to think of that as kind of a critical piece of infrastructure that you'd want to have in a digital era. So those three things are kind of, I think, increasingly what people think about as being digital infrastructure. What makes it public is that at the moment, some of these problems are solved by private actors. Um, so you're maybe some are using Facebook or Google to authenticate into websites, but those are private actors. And uh, those benefits are restricted to those who either can afford those services or who are maybe willing to sacrifice, um, if you are so concerned, some form of privacy in order to make use of it. 
what makes something, what makes infrastructure public is that we choose to substitute the capacity to pay or, or the need for profit. We, we substitute kind of market orientation for an orientation towards inclusion and access. And so the, so the public entity comes in and says, we will maybe run or we'll at least manage or regulate this in a way that puts inclusion and access as a central value in the offering of this infrastructure and regulates profits or removes profits by making it a publicly run thing altogether. And so the, this is, I think, the kind of most interesting and dynamic thing. I think, again, 10 years ago, most people didn't think a government could run a digital identity system, or most governments couldn't effectively run a payment system that would work for you know, 200 million or 100 million people. Now, between Brazil and India and Estonia, even places like Togo, um, there are lots of governments that are running at scale digital infrastructure that's serving uh, tens and sometimes hundreds and even a billion people. And so, what does it look like for that to become public? So what I thought we'd do is maybe have each of our speakers first talk a little bit about what is the kind of type of digital infrastructure they've been working on, kind of what does it mean, what's its significant, what's its benefit? So um, maybe Priscilla, do you want to talk first? Um, you worked on PIX. Can you just talk about like what is PIX, why is it interesting, and, and what is the benefit that it provides? Um, pick, um, thank you once, um, once again, David, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be, uh, um, uh, sitting here close to Matthew and Anir and to hear and also about your experiences. Um, so let's, um, start from the beginning. Um, PIX is a instant payment system, um, which means it connects, um, uh, the two sides of payments. So um, in a typical payment transaction, you have um, a payer um, who sends the money to a payee, the recipient of that fund. Um, PIX is um, both uh, the infrastructure that uh, allows for that instant settlement to happen, um, which um, up contains a settlement platform and also a uh, an alias database, which um, removes all the complexities of what a bank account is and simplifies the way we do transactions. And it is also um, a, um, a set of rules. So that's why we call the um, PIX not just a system, not just an infrastructure, but a scheme, which is an infrastructure plus a set of rules that coordinates how um, the system works. And why is that so important? Um, uh, the, the set of rules is what addresses many of the, um, of the market um, failures that might emerge in, um, in when there are um, only private actors, as you, David, have um, mentioned. Um, for example, uh, PIX in, in its rule book addresses how um, banks um, and how other payment service providers um, have to interact with the platform and how they have to interact with, um, with, uh, with the customers, with the, both the payers and the payees. As you mentioned, um, as one of the objectives of financial inclusion and enhancing access, if you don't have these rules, um, uh, 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 for example, pricing might be a problem. As you mentioned, some of the private schemes that are existing, they collect very high rents that some, sometimes we don't even notice. There is no salience in how much you pay. You don't even notice that that's embedded in the price. Um, however, um, if you don't address this directly, um, this also might not solve the problem just as an infrastructure. And this is how um, at PIX, we mentioned that it's, it, PIX is not just the system itself that makes all the wiring, all the plumbing, right? So the exchange of messages, um, how APIs work, um, what, what type of uh, a, a database that we have underlying there, but the set of rules is also very relevant and very important for a well-functioning system. Um, and just uh, as a, a, a way of providing some figures, um, PIX has been 
now after it was launched November 2020. Um, and after two years, um, a, a little after two years, it's been already used by more than 80% of the adult population in Brazil. Um, it has, as of now, in, um, and it's, uh, we don't fully call it inclusion, um, but it, it has increased access greatly. And just, uh, again, more than 65 million people who had never used the previous transfer system before have transacted through PICS. Bear in mind that the population of Brazil is like, the adult population is roughly 170. So 65 being gaining access to this new platform is quite striking. Um, and it has um, been uh, the, the system with the uh, highest and fastest adoption rate um, in, uh, in, in the world comparing to other fast payment systems. Um, so this is just to give a, a sense of how fast it grew. Um, and, and again, we, 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 uh, we do acknowledge the importance of having a, a, a sound infrastructure, but also I would just take this um, first, um, these first uh, opportunity to mention that the rules that govern the system are key and are uh, the essence of the success of PIX. Thank you. I mean, I think this for me is like, again, we talk about in, uh, entrepreneurial state. Um, I think if you ask most people, what is the fastest paying, what is the fastest growing payment platform that ever existed on the planet? Few people would have said, oh yeah, it's the government of Brazil. So uh, a really indication of like when state capacity aligns with the right needs and you really get it right, you can have huge amounts of impact in a very, very short period of time. Um, Matthew, you're not on the government, you're on the civil society side, but maybe could you indulge us a little bit to talk a little bit about like, what is a digital ID? Why is Jamaica interested in having a digital ID? And what's the kind of possible benefits and maybe some of the challenges, but particularly like, what's driving this? No, sure, David, thank you. Um, and, you know, just to kick off, I wanna say thanks for allowing me to be here and congrats to IIPP for the, hosting this for the seventh year. Um, of this of, of this event, and um, yeah, I think the, the the context is quite important. You know, so in Jamaica, um, we don't have a foundational ID, and so what that really means in in kind of non technical parlance is that every ID that people have in Jamaica is it usually serves some functional purpose. So we have people have a driver's license or they have a voter's ID. They have a passport, um, and this idea of creating a foundational ID has been around for the the mid the mid seventies. Um, and uh, the the challenge, but the challenge that we have in in Jamaica in the Jamaican context is that the ID options that are available, we operate a fairly low trust environment. And so whether you're trying to open a bank account or perform some sort of business service that requires you to disclose or prove who you are, you often have to show multiple IDs to be able to allow that to happen. And uh, the passport, which is the ID option that, most, that is mostly adopted by Jamaicans, only about 56% of the population has the passport. And so you're operating in an environment where one, the majority of your population, you know, you know, has to show, everyone has to show multiple IDs to perform things. Um, there's a non-trivial number of people in Jamaica who don't have access to one of those options or barely maybe one of those options and aren't really able to therefore kind of function um, effectively in that context. And so it's in that environment that successful administrations have said that, look, we actually need to solve this foundational ID problem. Um, and uh, so let's try to do that. And then uh, when the administration came into power in 2016, that was one of the priority things that they started working on. Perfect, thank you. And then Anir, can you talk a little bit about some of the work that's going on in Bangladesh, particularly interested in kind of data exchange and how you may be moving data around to solve problems, but, but even more just generally, like what, what's that kind of work going on in, in Bangladesh and thinking about digital infrastructure? Thank you, Dave. Uh, can you hear me properly? You're good. Some... Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, 
Good to be here with you and with uh, Matthew and Priscilla. A really interesting discussion, an important one. So David, if I could get a chance to just uh, share a couple of slides, I think it might be easier if that's okay. Thank you. So when we started doing digitization about a decade and a half ago, uh, in, in earnest, we had all these different sectors that wanted to go through a digital transformation. Uh, so land registration, uh, uh, land ownership, social services in terms of social safety nets, uh, health records and healthcare service delivery, health insurance, uh, education, uh, different types of justice sector efforts. All these really wanted to move to a digitization process without really knowing what it really meant. Um, and every process where we actually started looking at, we needed to understand how we identify the citizen. We had a birth registration, which was digital. We had uh, a national ID, which was digital, but it was fragmented. So we first started working on access side of things. So we, as we started digitizing the service delivery process, we also needed to make sure that it was accessible. So we created digital centers, uh, centers where citizens would come pay a small fee and have entrepreneurs uh, support them to access these digital services. We had a call center that we introduced uh, much later, actually in 2018, which became a lifeline during COVID because everything else was closed other than the call center. And people would actually call to get telemedicine service, to get uh, help with uh, emergency food distribution, would get help with uh, uh, many other things, even uh, e-commerce, we called it e-commerce at the time, phone commerce. And obviously, internet and smartphone, which is increasing. So when we started the decade and a half ago, it was less than 1% internet penetration. Now it's about 70%. Smartphone penetration is about 50% of the country. So there is the technical access and there is the non-technical assistive access, the digital summary constantly. But in every case, every case of uh, accessing data, uh, we actually talked about these five layers. So I already talked about the access layer. And I also talked about the services there, but underneath that, there is a plumbing that people don't usually see or consider when they think about public service delivery. And that's where I think uh, uh, Priscilla talked about the payments layer and Matthew talked about the identity layer. And I'll talk about the data layer, but these all are layered on top of each other. And uh, I want to just show you very quickly. So in terms of identity layer, we had many different identities that we needed to bring together into one unique ID, similar to what uh, uh, India has done with Aadhaar, but in the case of Bangladesh, we actually merged a lot of different IDs. In the case of India, it introduced a new ID, the Aadhaar ID. In the case of payments, we actually had several different payments ecosystems. So let's say the credit card that you talked about in the banking system and also the mobile financial services. And we need to integrate all of that to do this uh, one thing similar to India's UPI, Unified Payments Interface, called Binimon, which means exchange. And then the question you asked about the data, so there is the digital records uh, <clears throat> that we have at the bottom of different registries, the health registries, immigration registry, land registry, so on and so forth. And on top of that, we have the data exchange. So these data uh, components need to exchange information in a standard interoperable manner. So that's where the data exchange sublayer came about. And then on top of that, we have the analytics, dashboards, even predictive analysis, AI being used. I mean, during COVID, we actually used a lot of that cross-sector. And even data sharing between public institutions and private companies. That's also happened during COVID, unprecedented, but really gave us a lot of power in terms of tracking the disease, in terms of delivering uh, food uh, in, in far-flung areas. So a lot of data action was happening. But at the heart of it was really the consideration of interoperability and development of standards to share data. And now we actually are enacting a law for uh, data sharing and privacy, which we did not have. And we got into a lot of trouble by sharing data in a, in a non-standard fashion. But uh, COVID made it, made it happen because we saw the possibility and we actually took advantage of it. But now we're going back and fixing a few of the things, privacy that we may have broken, uh, non-standard way of sharing data that we have to uh, apply during an emergency situation, but now we are uh, bringing, them, bringing some order to that madness. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope this has painted at least a, a picture of like 
what entrepreneurial states can do and, and how, like what I always love is I always love having, you know, Anir and, and, and others come and talk, particularly in, in a mature market environment where you suddenly realize like the work that your government is doing actually doesn't feel all that cutting edge compared to the work that many emerging government, market governments are doing. So the kind of the, the real interesting action in my mind is really happening in places like Brazil, um, like India, um, uh, like in Jamaica. And so here like they're, they're pushing ahead in part because the need is greater. Um, often in mature markets, you have private sector actors that are extracting rents that are kind of providing a sufficiently good enough service that you don't have to worry about it. But in Bangladesh, you're like, no, actually no one's providing ID. So the, the state has to step in, but then the state has to take on an inclusive mindset and an infrastructure mindset in order to get the scale very, very quickly. So they have a different set of design parameters they're working for that kind of, I think has enabled kind of a leapfrogging opportunity. So let's talk about actually about what that state capacity is. Priscilla, I'd love to hear a little bit about like, like, how did this happen? Like, what, what, like, was like, was there like kind of like just we woke up one day and we're like, yeah, we should do this. And we didn't have to, we had all the capabilities in house that we needed. Or did this, did, did the government have to go and acquire new capabilities to make this happen? So I'd love to hear that from you in an ear. And then we'll go to Matthew and talk about the flip side. Like, what are the capacities we want to have outside of the state um, to make this possible? Maybe uh, first you, Priscilla. I think this um, relates to what you're saying on the need, right, that a society has. Um, and I'll have to start by saying that um, the first Brazilian, Brazilian public run system um, of payments dates back to 2002. Um, so the first real time uh, gross settlement system, the RTGS as we call it in the payments world, um, was created in Brazil in 2002, where we, um, when we launched what we call the national payment system. Um, so there was a capacity building starting from 2002. And, um, and also, uh, not only the technical capacity was there, um, 2013, I think it's just also good to take a step back and understand a, a little bit of the historical perspective on um, on the legal um, legal mandate that was given to the central bank of Brazil, and so uh, th there is this very important law that was um, in 2013 that gave the central bank um, the mandate first to oversee payment schemes. Um, so it streamlined and created uh, financial non bank financial institutions such as payment institutions, payment service providers. Um, and um, also it gave the, the, the central bank the mandate for three things that are quite um, important. One, to foster interoperabil interoperability in payments. Second, to foster efficiency in payment systems. And three, to promote financial inclusion. So that's in the law. So the central bank of Brazil um, had this mandate um, for these three very important um, uh, 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 to foster these three important objectives. And it, it was building already the capacity in-house. Um, and so the digital payments were growing, private actors were, um, in, were, um, were thriving. Um, you, as you mentioned, uh, card providers, debit card, uh, credit cards. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, the Central Bank of Brazil started with uh, various interventions um, to act accordingly to that mandate. For example, oh, let's establish some cap and interchange fees for debit cards. So there were a few steps towards achieving that objective of fostering interoperability, fostering efficiency, promoting financial inclusion. So there were these um, small, uh, not, not small, but these important action, actions that were being taken um, throughout the time. Um, however, at some point, um, uh, there was this nudging for the market, private sector, please go and address this A, B, and C. And on the other hand, the private sector has their own objective um, of making profit. So why would they go and create a platform that fosters interoperability? So the central bank then decided it's our role to do that. So March, 2018, a working group is created, the Instant Payments Working Group. 
Um, and fast forward, November 2020, um, two and a half um, months after that, PIX is launched. Um, fully in-house developed um, with a technical capacity that was, um, that was acquired throughout time and with a legal mandate to, um, to address the issues that it was given the, the mandate to do. And maybe with really good timing, because one, one interesting additional thing is the Brazilian state had been doing more and more work and doing direct benefits to citizens, like cash payments. And so PIC suddenly made that a whole lot easier as well. And that became particularly critical during COVID. So the 2018 launch turns out to be quite fortuitous because then the Brazilian government decides it wants to make payments during COVID to help support families. And PIX makes this radically easier for them to do for tens and tens of millions of people. Um, Anir, do you want to talk a little bit about like, I think when people think about Bangladesh, they think they think of like the dominant industry is like garments. And, and you know, but here actually we have quite a sophisticated technology operation going on. So how does the state build this capacity? You know, what are some of the steps you took to go about doing that? I think maybe it was a combination of three things. One really was the political will. So in 2008, the prime minister announced the concept of a digital Bangladesh. Uh, it was really a way to reach out to the first time voters. So in 2008, we had less than 1% internal penetration. So to talk about a country, a digital economy, a knowledge economy uh, to be achieved within the next 13 years, 2021, which was the 50th anniversary of the country's birth, I think took a lot of first time voters and in general population by surprise, but also gave the imagination to build a future. Uh, so that, that was exciting. Second was uh, really need. Uh, the idea came from the need that we had almost, uh, the number was unknown, but uh, the assumption was that we had a very large number of shadow voters or ghost voters. And in 2007 and eight, we needed to have a clean voter roll. Uh, and we found out that we had uh, when when the voter roll was made, we had to make it make it biometrically verified. So we took fingerprints, and the voter roll ultimately became national ID later on. But the need of the hour in 2007 and 8 was to create a very dependable voter registry uh, using biometrics. So that's how the national ID came about. Uh, the payments platform, interoperable payments platform, came from another need that we had close to 30 percent. Uh, leakage in our social safety net transactions. So because money would be allocated from the central bank, it would go to the district, then to the sub-district, then to the lowest tier of local government uh, in the country, 4,500 locations, and cash should be traveling. And when cash travels, cash also disappears a lot, right? Uh, so the need was that we would have a payment system which would deliver uh, cash in a digital cash manner. And this was incredibly useful. So we launched the pilot in 2017 and working with uh, Gates Foundation, uh, Better Than Cash Alliance, uh, CGAP of World Bank, so many different uh, uh, knowledge partners. Uh, so we launched it for 100,000 beneficiaries in 2017. Uh, and we needed to scale that up slowly to 30 million beneficiaries, which is the large numbers, so about uh, 14 to 15% of our Give them a few more seconds. If not, I'll go on. If someone can chat to to just tell them that we lost them, and then I'll but we'll go on. Um, so I, this piece with um, well, first is with both of these. I think are incredible stories of you know, uh, for many of us, including myself, kind of wake up and you're like, oh, it's the overnight success of picks, and and like it just it just came out of nowhere. And and for like, no, actually, there's a very long history here of all sorts of work. Both on the policy side, on the technical side, on the, like on the on the human capacity side, that go that kind of get band together to create this outcome, and and Anir is a similar thing. He's like, no, actually, we go. I have to go all the way back to two thousand eight. You're talking about the political will, creating the conditions, and then finding the places where there's needs, where the state response creates a feedback loop with the politicians that makes them want to do more and want to do more. Um, now, Matthew comes like from, to us from a very different perspective. Um, I think the the there is a nor like you've already heard some of the kind of the powerful impacts that kind of an infrastructure view can take in the way it can really scale services. But um, having the state have this capacity is is can be positive, can also be quite scary. 
And so I think there's real interest in understanding like what does good governance look like? And so Matthew, do you want to talk a little bit about like what is the role of civil society in all this? Um, and, how, and what have you been doing? No, absolutely, David. And, and, and I think, you know, kind of hearing some of, some of the, the, the perspectives from, from both Priscilla and Anir, it's, it's, I think it's, it's so important to have high capacity in the state. And, and I think, and, and the process of building that um, such that in both in a way that it's technically correct, you know, and, and great experience and all that sort and all the things that we've been articulating, but just also just the, the key part of it is that like trust is such an important component of the success of much of this work. And the thing about trust is that you don't get adoption if there's no trust. Um, and so the question around how do we build this infrastructure in a way that engenders trust and builds legitimacy within the broader ecosystem is a really important and sometimes hard part of this work because sometimes you find that government, you know, especially now we see a couple of different places where governments that are embarking on this journey are very interested in adoption very quickly. You know, especially you know, we sit and we hear the stories of of of, of pics and Adhar, and it's like, well, I want that thing, you know, I, I'd like that thing in my place, please. And so sometimes we fall into a trap, you know, or we've seen where there are ways in which the pursuit of adoption sometimes ends up as a coercion into adoption, and then that, and then obviously that, you know, undermines some of the trust in terms of making it necessary for accessing public services necessary for being able to engage with things that people were able to engage with before or the removal of optionality in the in the in the ecosystem and so the Jamaica kind of you know had an interesting journey here because the ID law that we ended up engaging with was the second one um, because the first one was actually struck down by the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional and it was struck down um, you know, because of a view around that there was a there was a mandatory requirement around the provision of biometric information to be able to access several other things that the the Supreme Court viewed as being um, a in, in conflict with right to privacy in 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 the Jamaican context. Um, but what was worse about that is that not only were there components of the bill that weren't great; it was a bad first bill. Um, but that it was rushed through the parliamentary process initially, um, partially influenced by access to a multilateral um, funding for the project. Um, and then, they, you know, there was this spread of misinformation during that period of time. I mean, all of us were getting these voice notes about the ID being the mark of the beast and like all of you are going to want all of this information. It was, it was, it was not a great place. And so that really was what motivated kind of the interest in wanting to engage in version two of the bill, because we said, you know, this idea of people having access to legal identification and a foundational ID was kind of too important to kind of fall in that in that disrepair that the version one um, did. So uh, I think on the side of civil society and now what capacity we need. Um, coming into this work. I think there are kind of maybe three ways that I, I can think of this. I think there's um, there's a technical capacity or technical correctness to kind of engage with the concepts of, you know, the ID or very, the broader things within a digital public infrastructure work. Um, but then I think the other parts, and there's another part around expertise that I think we often undervalue, and it's the perspective and proximity to community. Um, and to affected parties. And obviously when we talk about the state investing in public infrastructure and inclusion being a, compo a key component of that, you can't do that sustainably if you're not engaging with the diversity of actors that ultimately you're trying to serve. And so I think that idea that, you know, there is these broader sets of constituents that the state can partner with to be able to help bring that perspective into and inform the design and adoption and governance of these things is quite key. Um, and then the third is obviously, you know, this idea of own legitimacy and trust um, for the for the infrastructure, which um, comes from, you know, broader buying from stakeholders. Priscilla, I see you nodding a lot. I'm kind of curious, did, did you have an engagement with civil society or like, was there pushback on picks from, from any quarters? 
like what was the what was the interaction between kind of like the government and you know mostly civil society, although I can imagine the business sector as well. Just curious about what that interaction was. Um, so uh, it's thank you, Matthew, for bringing that, and I think that's the piece that um, was sort of new in the way the Central Bank of Brazil had to run this new system, right? So we did have, as, as I mentioned, the technical capacity in running and uh, an RTG system, a settlement system before. We did have um, the software developers, we did have the banking sector monitoring. However, there was this new component that was required because if we are talking about addressing and uh, addressing access, and addressing inclusion, we need to go all the way to the user. We need to have a different approach to developing systems and removing ourselves from just what is the best possible technical efficient way to develop a platform, right? Uh, so one of the things, and this was kudos to, to, my, to my team back there <laughs> um, that understood that, and one of the first pieces that were um, a key piece that was uh, even um, in regulation created was something that we call the PICS Forum. The PICS Forum um, brought all parts of society, um, both those directly involved, for example, the banks, the non-banks, the, the credit unions, so everyone in the financial financial sector, um, all those payment service providers who would get access to the platform, of course, they had a lot to say. They they needed to understand the technical the, the details, how the access would would be, how participation in the system would be. But also, um, that forum was not just restricted to the payment sector. You, you would have. Um, businesses. So we, uh, the team back then spoke to retail, um, retail um, stores, for example, um, if, if you go back and check one of, uh, of uh, our, the events that we had, we had this, uh, the small business uh, provider, um, the seller, the small shop, we did go into society, we talked to those people. We had this open forum where everyone could pitch in and say, this is, this is okay, this doesn't work. You have um, uh, so, uh, software um, automation uh, companies uh, also saying this works, this is not ideal, this doesn't foster interoperability, you're gonna get stuck here in a bad equilibrium. So we did have, uh, lot, uh, 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 a broader um, part of society. And for example, uh, uh, Matthew would be awesome being also part of the PIX forum there and bringing their perspective on what's actually happening in the community. So that was uh, one of the things that happened. Um, and so no product was developed and launched before we interacted with society gained all the perspectives. And again, at, at some point you will have colliding opinions and you do have to arbitrate, you have to referee and you have to take a decision. Um, and that again, with the North Star of promoting um, financial inclusion, fostering interoperability and efficiency. Yeah, I think like, one of the things that's so important about this is it's not just a technical problem. Like there are, like infrastructure is in some ways kind of a coercive act. Like uh, when you think about even electricity, like today you kind of don't think about it, you just turn on the switch. But there was a time in history when there were probably many competing electrical providers, they might have been thinking about different voltages, amperages, and like someone came along and said, no, actually you all have to do it this way. And we're actually gonna eliminate choice, we're gonna compel everybody. And I think if you want to kind of like water infrastructure or sewage infrastructure, there were probably people who had jobs like bringing water to homes and all those people, like once you had water plumbing, those people were all going to lose jobs. And so you had to find a way, like how are we going to engage them? How are we going to bring them on this journey? How are we going to like create new opportunities? Like I don't want to go back to a world where we don't have water plumbing. Um, and so that is a trade-off that I think was ultimately good, but there were consequences for people. And so what's the journey you're going on and how are you bringing people along that journey? And it, it requires some engagement. And so that's why it's like so interesting to hear about, about this exchange. Um, maybe it'd be great to hear what have been some of the challenges. So maybe we'll go in reverse order. We'll start with Matthew and you could talk about like, what were some of the challenges that got you engaged and got civil society engaged? And then Anir as well, like what are, what are the challenges you've had in, in, 
in kind of deploying this at scale? What have been the big obstacles or, or the things that keep you up at night? And then we'll come to you with the same question, Priscilla. So Matthew, what, what are some of the challenges that got you engaged and things that have you worried? Um, so I think the kind of where I started before on the challenges, like how poorly version one went. I think it was like, it was, it was, it was terrible. I mean, the, in just, just in the broader ecosystem, the broader country environment, as the bill was being passed, it was like one of the largest, longest parliamentary sessions. They were, you know, the parliament was there to like 1.30, 2 a.m. because the bill had to be passed by a particular period of time. Um, I think the things that still, you know, that still, I still wrestle with that keep me engaged is that even though version two of the bill was a lot better, there are, you know, there, there are new things that this kind of infrastructure creates, introduces within the society. It's a, it's a very different kind of capability. And the, the governance of this, this new infrastructure is really important. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges that we're still, that still isn't quite re um, resolved in the case of ORs and different ID systems have taken different approaches is around the idea of like when you use your identity your your identity card your id card there's a log that's created of that there's a record that's created of that and each service that you use that record with is another record of how you are moving through that society and this idea of like what information is collected how is it retained how is it being processed um, that was something when we were engaging in the law, the government said, actually, we're going to resolve that in regulation. Um, and so, you know, the, the regulations have come out, it's not fully addressed in the regulations. Um, but, you know, that was a design choice. Um, they didn't, that didn't have to be that case. I think in the, in the case of Adhar, that information is deleted, so it's not retained. Um, so there, there, there are different approaches that we can take, but it's just like, these are things that um, you know, this new capability is really important. It provides the state with new ways to solve problems, which I, like you, I don't want to go back to having to carry water to be able to have access to it. But the question of how we govern um, this new infrastructure is really important. And I think it requires a, a broader set of actors to be engaged in that. Anir, how about you? What, what are some of the things that have you worried or some of the challenges, either technical or around governance that have arisen in, in your work? I think things have evolved. Sorry, I got disconnected. Uh, the internet actually gave up on me. Uh, so what, what I was saying towards the end, I'll just uh, mention, I'll finish that within 30 seconds. It's really the issue of, uh, I think, need, need of the hour. So I think I started with the political will that really drove this, then COVID accelerated many adoption of the ID and payment systems. So I think it's the need of the hour that drove uh, adoption in, in a large scale. So I think that that's what happened. But in terms of challenges, I'll talk about a few. The first one, really, we we always talk about this mindset. So mindset of whether we want to be citizen centric or citizens should come to us for services. So that control oriented mindset. Second thing is really about control of data. We don't want to give control of my data to somebody else. And when I say my data, an agency thinks that that agricultural data is the Ministry of Agriculture's. Uh, 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 asset. Ministry of Health will think that all the patient data is health minister's asset, not the patient's asset. Uh, education will think all the education related data is education minister's asset, so on and so forth. So we don't want to give control of my data to somebody else. So the question of interoperability and data standards becomes difficult because if I don't want to share, why would I follow standards? Because it's, I mean, I'm completely in a silo, I'm the king. So I think going beyond that is, is important. And we have been able to establish that through carrots and sticks in some fashion. Uh, the third important issue is the vested interest groups within government and outside of the government. For instance, uh, land registration. I mean, this is something we worked on for many years, uh, six, seven years before we handed over to the land ministry. So we worked from the prime minister's office to digitize land, land records because there were so many vested interest groups just to give you an example, we have twice as much land on paper as we have on land. So, I mean, a lot of disputes, a lot of uh, duplications, and we can't bring them together, right? So we have to really use the, the authority of the prime minister's office to break down some of these vested interest groups. The fourth really is the skills gaps. 
and uh, uh, skills gap within the within the within the government. So I'll give you an example. In 2009, when we did a series of workshops to talk about what digitization meant for every agency, I mean there were course of agencies who said that, okay, I'll open an email account and that's my extent of digital thinking. In 2021-22, when we did a series of exercises similarly with about 300 agencies, we actually got a lot of ideas around artificial intelligence. Just before chat GPT happened, this is, this is something before chat GPT happened. A lot of them talked about tracing food safety, and uh, uh, leather quality, uh, because we have uh, leather industry becoming actually bigger for exports, uh, uh, using blockchain. We talked about, not we talked about, I think the agencies talked about how they would use uh, drones to inspect high voltage uh, power lines. So in a decade plus, the skills gap actually have, have become much less. So really working on thousands and thousands of people uh, within government, uh, civil servants, uh, service providers, actually we saw this massive change. And the fifth one, really in the policy and legal environment, we have a lot of archaic laws from the, even some from the 1800s that govern how we think through things and how we operate and how we actually deliver services to citizens. We have a lot of policies that conflict with each other uh, and are not future, uh, uh, future proof or forward looking. So we also have to go through a lot of uh, cleaning up or uh, interoper establishing interoperability between policies, if I may use that word, not in an API sense, but they have to make sense with each other. They have to actually reduce conflicts. Just when we are doing the civil registration, we saw several laws that were in conflict with e each other. So we had our NID law, national ID law, we had our statistics law, and we had our birth registration law in diff three different ministries were in conflict with each other to create the, the single unique ID for the uh, for the citizens. And we have to clean up those, those legal environments. So those are some of the challenges that we still face. And as we find them, uh, we work on them and we uh, try to come out better at the other end of the tunnel. Priscilla, having um, launched, helped launch the world's most fastly adopted payments platform, what challenges do you see and also, and also kind of like, what advice would you have to other governments that are trying to do something similar? I think two, um, uh, I think two things I already mentioned. I think the one is how to engage civil society. And I think that is a shift in the way um, typical central banks and governments um, operate. So I think that's important. And that relates a lot to one of the to technical capacity, as Anir was mentioning. Um, governments, they don't hire the same way private sector hires, right? So um, that, that was indeed a, a struggle within the Central Bank of Brazil. Um, pro project management wise, we had less like, it, it was developed in less than two years, right? Um, how do you g gather all the resources that you need and make sure that uh, the gaps that you have, both in knowledge and resources you gain from inside? So all of that is, is something that you can't take for granted, right? Um, th there is a need for uh, great technical capacity, uh, design thinking, agile methodologies, uh, creating MVPs, testing ideas, all of that not necessarily is part of the skill set that governments typically have in developing their products, right? So I think that was one of the um, the issues that uh, that that were very important in the development of PICS. Um, and that only was possible because there was again, like Anir mentioned, buy-in from the board of the of the central bank. Um, in a sense, they had to shift. Uh, resources from other projects towards PICS, right? Because there is just a limited amount of resources within within um, within the organization. So that was required. So having the buy-in, having 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 the support of these uh, of the major uh, stakeholders, that was key. Um, developing the technical capacity was also key. But I want to uh, just now just touch upon two economic issues that usually that. that uh, people usually ask, which is, um, why would the private sector engage with you if 
you were somehow a, a competing solution to what they were offering, right? And that's a recurring question that comes up. Um, and again, I realized that this is not true for every jurisdiction. Not all countries do have this mandate, but the Central Bank of Brazil has this mandate. And one of the things that was key, and, and this is um, what we address in, in, in the BIS bulletin that I wrote together with the BIS colleagues and the Central Bank <laughs> colleagues, uh, we mandated the participation of the large institutions. A payment uh, system is a two is a platform that connects two sides, right? So you do need network effects. You need the m critical mass for a system to work. If just three people on one side adopted and five on the other, when there are millions that are outside, why would you try, tr go into that platform? So you do need a critical mass, and to create that network effect. One of the things that the Central Bank of Brazil did um, that was really right is was mandated participation of all the institutions um, that had more than 500,000 accounts. Um, again, I realized that this is not possible in every jurisdiction, not every sing single central bank uh, out there has this mandate and can do that. But that was something that um, was really uh, key in the case of Brazil. And another thing that was also key is addressing uh, one particular aspect, which is pricing. As you mentioned, um, we didn't want, um, if, for example, you had to pay uh, one, um, one euro to uh, transact every time you would buy something or you would send money, you would probably not do, you would probably not transact. So the thing that uh, the Central Bank of Brazil did was any individual when paying, they cannot be charged anything and that's part of the regulation. So these are two key components. Again, this goes back to the first thing that I mentioned in, in, in my first remarks, which is it's not just the platform, it's the rules that govern the system that play a big role in the success and in addressing um, uh, financial inclusion, addressing interoperability, openness, and, um, and, and so on. Um, just one last thing that I would like to mention, and this is what keeps me awake, <laughs> which is um, we have, and I think we were very successful in addressing financial in inclusion in, in a sense, uh, in, in the access point. That doesn't mean that this has enhanced fully the lives of people. And this is something that I think we need to guarantee that that access um, also provides at a, a further, um, that, that this first entry also provides further um, financial services, right? Um, and that you can gain, for example, access to cheaper credit, that this can uh, help people um, better uh, manage cash flows in, when, when you're a, a small entrepreneur, for example. So I think it's not just opening a bank and be able, being able to transact, is that being a door for even um, a broader set of financial services. And I think this is something that um, doesn't fully depend on picks. It depends on a broader, uh, a, a broader um, vision on how to address financial inclusion. Thank you. So I want to open up the floor because uh, you have in front of you one mild-mannered, not particularly interesting faculty member, but you have two people who together have launched services that serve, I think, over 400 million people. And there's not a lot of times you're going to be able to ask someone like that questions. And then you have uh, another person in Matthew who's not really kind of talked about it in all the detail, but who, by working with the coalition, like when he went to parliament to go and testify, their coalition was supposed to have five minutes and about three minutes in parliament kind of, the parliamentary committee basically realized that there was a lot of substance here and basically cleared the docs and said, we need to give you at least a day, if not a couple of days. And it led to um, a number of revisions of, of the law. And so in terms of someone actually interacting and thinking about how to shift the government's thinking around infrastructure, uh, Matthew Gray represents, in my mind, like one of the people who's been the most successful in engaging governments and, and closing the gap between civil society and state actors to improve the way these things can be, can be, can be launched and, and run. So I'd love to kind of just open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, you, ma'am. Thank you. So I basically have four 
thematic areas. I want to have questions on, but I'll, I'll... Let's start with one. Yeah, I'll start with one. Um, so my recent research engagement was mostly around unpacking the term digital public infrastructure and looking at the various definitions. And what I realized was that all of them were fairly normative or inductive. So most of the sources of information would describe payments, data exchanges, and would just call that DPI. Or some of the definitions would simply include words, very value-laden words, such as inclusivity, access, innovation, efficiency, et cetera. And I realized not a lot of information was based on empirical evidence. Uh, so I, and I did sense this bit of subversion of empiricism, where, as Matthew said, there is a bit of coercive adoption. A lot of population-scale technologies are just unleashed, especially coming uh, from India, where the incumbent government has really pushed through a lot of initiatives across sectors. So I just wanted to understand uh, from the panel here that in terms of future pathways, specifically with respect to research, what kind of longitudinal studies that need to be incubated in order to build that body of evidence, really? Yeah. Great question. Does anybody want to take a first crack? Matthew, are you, uh, can, I, can I tempt you? Sure. And so, so the question, if I understand it correctly, is around the kind of research that needs to be done to build a case for this, these foundational systems. Um, and then I think there is a first part around, well, how have we arrived at this place in terms of like, these are the things, um, you know, and so I'll, I'll maybe take the definition part in a second. You're absolutely right. There are a ton of competing definitions <laughs> around there. Um, and, you know, and I think though, I think part of the the, the, the contest of definitions that we see right now in this space quite early is because of, I think a lot of people recognize the importance of this, of what's, what's happening, you know, because what the, what the world of the, what kind of the DPI space is saying is that one, there are these capabilities that a lot of countries or general pub, the public is, is recognizing are really central to being effective in an increasingly digital world. And so those, so you, on one side you have these capabilities, but then on the other side that we're we're also saying that those capabilities that are central, the state wants to make a strategic decision not to solve those problems in silos, but to lift that up and solve them strategically at the level of society. And here is how, as a community, as a society, as a nation, we're going to solve these problems. And so. There's there's a lot of interest in both of those things, <laughs> um, and and why I mean the the competing definitions is really kind of like the tip of the iceberg um, around kind of the the varying interests that often persons like Priscilla and Anir have had to engage with in terms of building out this work. I know we've heard a little bit about that today. Um, I think the the point around the evidence base I think is really important. Um, and I would put the evidence as almost on two camps. I think there's one around the, the, the monitoring and the evaluation that we need to do while we're building these systems and while they're being operating, because the thing with a lot of this work is that exclusion happens on day one. You know, it, you know it's not as if that we can figure out and, and, and if we can wait two, three years to understand who are we excluding from this process. And so the state also needs to develop a capability, oftentimes in collaboration to a broader set of partners to understand who, how well are we serving, you know, the, the varying constituents, who is not being served well, and who is ultimately being left behind as part as we roll out these, these systems. And that needs to be an ongoing process. Um, inclusion isn't just something that we check a box on. It's really if we want these systems to be societal level in their reach, then there will always be new and better ways that we can provide inclusion for, for, for persons. And so there's kind of that ongoing learn as we go part of it. And I think the other part is, and, and, and Priscilla kind of touched on this a little bit, it's like, okay, well, but then there's like the longitudinal long form research that we might need to be doing to understand both the impacts of introducing these systems in different places um, but also the 
ability of these systems to affect some long-standing problems that have existed in the society. And so this idea of moving someone who has had limited access or usage of particular financial products, moving them from just, okay, now I have an account, which is, which is transformative in its own sense, but then moving them along that pathway, what are the best methods to doing that is also something that we need to better understand. Um, that's a first pass, the first try. If I can maybe, can I... oh, yo, go for it, please, Priscilla. Yeah, it's just, I'm, let me try to take a stab at that, at that as well. And again, I'm, I'm going to take this from the perspective of payments, um, of course. Um, I, I, I get that. Um, the, the, I think the ultimate goal of why someone or a government or is doing that is, is important, right? And being having an evidence-based approach to that is key, um, fully agree. It can, it can be that there are just personal interest in having a name because you launched a very successful system, but are you indeed uh, reaching your, your ultimate goals? And um, now I'm gonna be just, I, I am now not in the Central Bank of Brazil anymore. I'm in the Bank for International Sentiments. And there are just a couple pieces of research that I would like to mention, for example, that we're trying to take a look at. Um, for example, one is the real impact on how what PIX has had in firms, small firms, and in banks, and analyzing the overall uh, welfare. Um, has it increased? Has it not? Is it just access, or has it been uh, able to already uh, introduce more benefits um, at large? Um, so I think, again, um, that's a process that's going to be ongoing, right? So we will um, have more potential now with the, these digital infrastructures. We will have more data to analyze and to run more research. And I think we're, we're getting there. There's this chicken and egg. So would you implement first the digital infrastructure or do you wait for... Um, uh, for the research that is going to explain what uh, that the, the benefits are there. Um, and so uh, now I think we, at, at least in Brazilian case, we're more, uh, we're, we're more equipped to do that. Um, having said that, jurisdictions are different. The Brazilian experience cannot be fully imported somewhere else, right? And this is also uh, 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 something that I think needs to be looked at. And this is the second piece of research. Now we have lots of payment systems, lots of fast payment systems globally, and we're trying to compare them and analyze what the key, what the, the, key, um, uh, the key elements should be present depending on how you start, right? So uh, an European country might start very differently in terms of market structure, in terms of demand, in terms of, uh, of dig digitalization, digital literacy of the population. So there are a lot of these different components that come into play. And what is essential in each one of these cases? And we're trying to provide also this comparative analysis on multiple platforms um, with the same purpose and seeing what's actually key to address uh, uh, what objective. So I'll stop So I'm there. gonna, let's go to a couple more questions, but although maybe just quickly, the one thing I would add is certainly my, the definition that we wrote here, I wrote here, does have normative elements because I want those normative elements embedded in the conversation and not to be divorced. So rather than saying like, we just created a highway and we actually have no opinions about the safety on that highway, I, I, I'm not sure I agree that not everybody adheres to all of those definitions, but if we insert it into the definition, we at least maybe force the conversation and that helps kind of put that onto the, onto the agenda of the governments that are doing. That was certainly kind of my intent in trying to inject that in there. So I think it's an excellent question and, and super critical. Let's go uh, maybe two more questions. Um, yes, you, sir. You can just ask your question then I'll get another one. Are you online? Yeah. Okay. Hello, um, my question is more sort of logistical operational project management oriented. So you've got a project and that's great and it's a, an amazing project, but in terms of the adoption side of it, we all know the saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. So you've got an engagement with a huge number of people, but then how do you ensure that there's adequate adoption from all of them? And then in terms of the 
operational homogenization? How do you ensure that you have a consistent ops model within this project to be able to propose and implement? And then in terms of the maintenance of that, how do you ensure that this doesn't just spiral into oblivion? How do you ensure that the operations of it is consistent? Okay, wow, Thank so you. big running tech at scale questions. Let's go online and do you have a question from online? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Beatriz, we have some comments in the in the chat. Beatriz is really interested in how the Brazilian government decided to go more actively into the to the market and like this idea of shaping the market. So, what were the drivers behind this decision, and this, there were there any like tensions in, in this process? And Maurice has a interesting. Let's just do one question. Okay. I don't want to overburden. Yeah, sure. So okay. let's go with these two questions. Maybe we'll start with you, Priscilla, and then Anir, just see if you have thoughts on on this kind of question of scale. Um, so, uh, and I think um, I, I, I did mention that the um, the proactive role came more, I think, as a realization that um, the other initiatives were not um, enough. Not in just um, issuing regulation was not enough. Just encouraging the private sector to act was not enough. And this is this realization that there was this need for a public good is what led for um, PICS to, to become a project, become, become a possibility. And um, of course, um, there was some tension in the beginning, I think, again, from the big players that probably felt threatened, right? So this is my market, <laughs> what are you doing there? Um, but I think at, at, with time, they realized also that, you know, um, it's it's going to happen. It's going to be big. So I need to be there and I, I need to be there and I need to provide the best service I can. Um, so this tension, I think, faded with time. Um, on, on the project management, I'll just say um, uh, this briefly and how to guarantee uh, uh, adoption. Um, I think, again, I've already mentioned from the perspective of uh, the of the central bank that it was within the mandate uh, 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 to, to make it uh, an obligatory participation of the large institutions. Of course, again, not, not necessarily uh, the, the same thing can happen in all jurisdictions. Um, but on the other hand, one thing that I think is important and maybe Anir can expand more on that is standards, right? Um, when we took the approach of user centeredness, we understood that it was also important for all participants to offer a, a similar uh, service uh, to all to all individuals, for example. So um, one of one of the things that Central Bank did was create not only the platform, but standardized APIs for the industry to connect to the system standardized user experience for an individual to find exactly the same experience if you choose bank A, PSP B, uh, credit union C, you will find a standardized experience. So I think with that, you will find, for example, the whole market coordinating themselves to guarantee that it's easy to adopt and that everyone can, um, um, can, um, can operate and can transact. Um, addressing switching costs as well. Um, I think this is important again, and this is why this uh, focus on the user and how they will adopt is a new skill that the central bank has to have. Anir, is there anything you wanted to add? Sure. Uh, in terms of scaling up, I think standards allow scaling up. Uh, citizens want standards and government should want standards and increasingly they are wanting standards. Uh, companies may not want standards because standards allow opening up and companies don't always want to open up their markets to other competitors. So I think it's the governments who have to drive standards with a clear understanding of what standards actually will achieve in terms of citizen centricity. And uh, in terms of adoption, I think we have always seen that uh, doing the right design, going through a design thinking process, involving the Customers. Uh, in the case of Bangladesh, we have uh, uh, trained about 35,000 civil servants on something called empathy training. And actually, actually, deep dive of understanding what the citizens go through in terms of hassle, uh, 
the number of trips that they have to make uh, to come to government offices. Uh, and, and this has actually resulted in a mini revolution in terms of citizen centric thinking. And just to give you some, uh, uh, the, the first question was about empirical evidence about uh, DPI. I just wanted to address that a little bit as, as well. Uh, we've been measuring uh, uh, how digitization has helped citizens. And we measure this across three criteria, three metrics, very simple ones, uh, called time, cost, and the number of visits. So how much have we reduced in terms of time, cost, and the number of visits called TCV. And we've seen in the last uh, decade and a half, actually maybe 12 years or so, we've reduced about 19 billion days about $22 billion and about 13 billion visits have been eliminated because the people did not have to travel to government offices and they could apply from their nearby locations or from their from the uh, convenience of their phones or their computers. Uh, so citizen-centric design is actually very, very important. Uh, so we are calling it DPI now. So we just, we've just given it a new label, uh, but we've always realized that we need to identify the citizens we're serving. We need to actually have a standards-based, seamless, integrated payment system. We need to have data exchanges, data interoperability using standards to create the right services to the right access. So I think we've always understood that. Uh, we've just given it a new label called DPI, which is allowing a common language amongst policymakers across the globe, not just within a country, but across the globe. And that is, I think, a useful thing. Thank you. Matthew, maybe just quickly to go to you. I feel like Matthew, in some ways, you did almost like oppositional design, where you like did design uh, that the government didn't ask you to do, but by doing it, you could make the service better. Do you want to just can you just share how a few bars on like some of the design work that you did um, and how you shared that with politicians so they could really understand the impact? Yeah, um... <laughs> positional design. Well, let's let's we were committed to the same cause. Let's 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 have that as a as a starting <laughs> point. Um, but but it was it was really critical because I think the question, you know, one, we were at the legislative stage of the process, which you know, for most people, they don't engage with legislation. Like that's not a very useful thing to kind of go and say whether this subclause or clause is like how does this affect their their lives. But in the discourse, I think, and, and where the, you know, slash roots came to the process and we worked with um, in that discussion, a, a number, a broader set of actors um, on the civil society side, we kind of, we come very much grounded from the service design experience. And like, how does this manifest in the life of the persons that are going to be interacting with it? And so a lot of our work was saying, well, you know, the way that this law is structured or how this is is kind of crafted this is the risk that it creates but here is what the risk looks like for an average person and so there is you know in one specific case there's a there's a the the, the law talks about enrollment process and one of there's too in much information that the government requires during the enrollment process but that's a different thing um but the enrollment process effectively said that two things one when you enrolled for the ID, you had to provide your primary residence, but any other residence is that you might frequent in terms of like if you lived in multiple places. And uh, we built this kind of this persona, one of the contributions back to that process. And if you, and then the other part of it was, if you don't provide the information that the, author, the ID authority requ requires of you, you potentially commit a crime you know, and civil, not criminal. But so you, you combine those things and we built this kind of, this, this, this persona around that, the combination of those two things to show, you know, you might have someone, John, that lives in a rural community, is moving into Kingston to go to the university there, is enrolling in the ID, but for whatever reasons, chooses only to include his ID, his address in Kingston, because he thinks that one looks better on his job, job applications. In a formal, in a strict reading of the law, John has now committed a crime within the context of the law. And you put that before, you put those three things before someone and it's like, well, obviously that's not what we mean. But then the, the, my, our response is, but that's what you've written. And so that, that may be fine. Well, let's, let's make that adjustment such that the law is aligned with not just the intent, but how it might be used 
you know, not just by, not by you necessarily. Maybe you're a great, you know, law person, you know, parliamentarian, but there might be someone in that office or someone in the in the ideal authority who now has this power that could be used it to to in in an abusive way. So let's solve the problem from the start. And so that's how we tried to tie that user experience to kind of how it affected different stages of the process of adoption. All right, let's go. Uh, more questions? Uh, yeah, you, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, the, the case of PIC sounds really interesting um, to me. And someone I was talking to someone today, and they're actually complaining about the problem with PICs is that um, the the government uh, requires that social service payments go through PICs. Um, maybe he got it wrong, but I was actually thinking, actually, that's a good thing because you know I have a particular interest in um, the gyro bank as a form of like uh, UK payments, publicly owned new payments technology, which actually, you know, um, introduced lots of innovation into the payment system. But the reason why it was not quite as successful as it could have been is that um, the government didn't take make full use of it, right? They, they continued using other banks because they didn't want to be seen to be favoring it when they could have um, put all of their balances in a gyro bank. So, yeah, I think gov governments should be like, backing themselves properly. And I think on, on I guess my question is like on central bank digital currency, there seems to be an issue where like, you know, quite related where governments are struggling to get people to adopt. And I think the issue is that the like cost of the current system and the issues are like hidden from the consumers. So it's difficult to, um, you know, get people to adopt it. Um, sorry, can you skip yeah, What's sorry. the question? The, the question, sorry, that was the question, like how do you get around that without like forcing people into a system and then people obviously reacting negatively to feeling like they're being coerced? Thank you. And then there's a question up here at the front as well. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna ask the question that uh, right away. So uh, I noticed that there are, um, uh, common factors of success between the, the three experiences in three uh, or in two different countries. Uh, basically, the, the political will and the innovative leadership. So, uh, especially in Bangladesh, don't you think that uh, other than the political will itself, uh, the political stability having considered that you put a very promising strategy for 30 years or for 20 years, so without having the political stability in the first place, how do you guarantee that uh, all this will be uh, achievable? For, and the like, second, yeah, yeah, the second thing for Bangladesh as well is the, uh, the civil service as one of the challenge, the weak performance of the civil uh, service, so didn't you think about the, the BBI as uh, a core of uh, to reform the civil service itself? Uh, and how did you manage to get the private sector having considered that uh, there is a lack of uh, uh, data protection and administrative legal framework in Bangladesh? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Anir, do you want to take a first crack? Uh, you mentioned about the civil services underperformance. Uh, so we actually are using DPI. Again, keep in mind that DPI is a label that we have given to the entire stack of work that we've been doing for the last one year or so. Before that, we never used the uh, DPI. I think, again, a lot of uh, movement by the, the development partners uh, and uh, several governments uh, who are at the forefront of building and using DPI brought that terminology to the forefront in the last one year or so. But the concept of DPI we've been using for over a decade. And we have used that whole concept as a tool for reform. So uh, we created those 9,000 centers in the country as an extension of sales service to provide last mile uh, uh, service offering to millions of people. Uh, six to seven million people go to these centers. And that's an extension of civil service by local entrepreneurs. So this, this, they actually sell the services that the government offers, such as birth registration and passports and land records and so on and so forth uh, for a small fee. That's one kind of reform. Another kind of reform is 
really the structure of the of the government in terms of changing services. Uh, so we have created what are called innovation teams in every department, every district, and every sub-district. And these innovation teams continuously focus on service process simplification, essentially business process engineering for every service. We have actually simplified close to a thousand services uh, by these SPS teams or innovation teams uh, mm -hmm. in the case of different departments. So this whole effort is really an administrative reform process tied to the cabinet's function to supervise all ministries. And the cabinet has actually created something called the annual performance agreement for the last six years or so. And within the annual performance agreement that it signs with all the line ministries and the line ministries then subsequently sign them with the, the departments underneath these line ministries uh, and digitization simplification and performance of the innovation teams are at the heart of annual performance agreement. So that's how we've actually used the concept of DPI without calling it DPI within administrative reform. In terms of, uh, I think you, you talked about privacy. Uh, uh, so that's an area of concern um, within, within, within Bangladesh right now. So we don't have a privacy law. We're working on it right now, especially triggered by the way we have used uh, private data and public data to track the disease. So we didn't have a RT-PCR lab. Uh, we had one RT-PCR lab in a country of 165 million people in 2020 when the pandemic started. So we actually used the telcos and said that, okay, people would call into this one single hotline that we had, 333, which had been used for other purposes to share information and uh, access services for citizens. So people would call in, provide their symptom information over an interactive voice response system, IVR system, and we'd use artificial intelligence to actually find out where the biggest concentration of calls were coming from and what kind of symptoms they have in those locations. And that's how we track the disease for a number of months before we put together our RT-PCR labs across the country, hundreds of them. Uh, so that's an area where during those months, we actually use data without having the right kind of protection, privacy protection in place. And now we're putting them in place. So I think uh, to your concern of data protection, I think we did violate quite a bit of that. I think uh, we never really went back and analyzed it to, 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 to the extent that I know. But uh, now we're actually going back and putting the guardrails uh, for privacy protection. Priscilla, did you want to talk a little bit about the, the first question? Yeah. Um, I'll just um, address quickly CBDCs. Most of the retail CBDC projects that you'll see, they're addressing payments. So it, it, it's, it's similar. You might call it different because it's different technology. But in, in a way, they are trying to address some of the similar problems that PIX has addressed. And if that's the case, then you need to just go back and see what's the gap. If there is no gap, um, there is very little case for adoption. Um, so it, and what is the need? How does the user benefit? And what do you want to do? So I think many of these projects, I, I, I'm not sure if they are Fully, address, uh, fully addressing these questions on what the gap really is. Um, and also, again, back to the design thinking, addressing and guaranteeing um, that the user is in the center and that, um, and, and I think uh, all the things we have discussed already. Um, Matthew, sorry, go for it. So just a, just a quick, on this, and I, I think on the, the the point around the the mandating of things, though, and and the state, I think the the question around when and how the state should decide around mandating adoption is a really hard question, and it is very context specific. And I think there's like oftentimes like there there. There's a lot of like emotion that comes in when when, when this 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 topic is brought is brought up, and uh, it's it's hard. You know, um, I'm definitely more on the side of we should be very cautious about the mandating of adoption, um, or our mandating of use because I think you know there, depending on where your context is in terms of like how broadly the system is being used or other kind of structural factors, like it it immediately makes in a certain kind of exclusion and discrimination. Um, but in sometimes it, it solves a really critical 
problem. And I think unless we're committed to solving that problem, it's hard to have the dis the, the discussion around it. You know, when um, when Anir talks about like, yeah, we were losing 20, 30 percent of our payments through for our social protection program through our existing systems, like we need to have that 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 discussion. And it can't just be that we are not to you know, mandating is completely bad. That shouldn't be on the table because the question is, all right, well, how do we solve, how, how do you suggest that we solve that problem? Um, and so I think it's, it is hard, um, but I think we need to kind of extend grace on both sides of like the need to respond to the problem as well and not just kind of say this shouldn't be a policy option. So I want to wrap things up. And I think the way I want to talk about that is, what you're seeing in front of you are um, actors who are, I think, at the very front of thinking about what some new forms of state capacity look like. And they're really wrestling with what are both the advantages and the kind of concerns that that new capacity raises. And I think this is a relevant discussion for everybody, because in my own view, um, you're not going to get out of the 21st century without having some form of digital ID. You're not making it through the 21st century without some way of making online transactions and probably instant payments in some ways, particularly in places that don't have payments at all. And you're probably not getting out of the 21st century without some way of exchanging data to solve problems, particularly public sector problems. So my own view on this is the things that we're talking about are an inevitability. The only question that remains is, are they gonna be privately provisioned with a private set of rules? Are they gonna be public provisioned, which carries its own set of dilemmas? And what is the regulatory regime around this gonna look like? And the people in front of us today, are, our kind panelists, are people who are both inside the government and outside the government that are wrestling with what those governance questions look like, and even just the basic operational questions. And so I think they provide a window into what the future of the entrepreneurial state looks like. So with that, I'm hoping that maybe you can thank all of our panelists for zooming in from the various places they were at and generously giving their time. Thank you, Priscilla and Nia and Matthew. Uh, really, really interesting conversation. And um, you remind, like, this is why I feel so passionate about this topic and having you all being able to give time to be able to come in uh, and be able to share all that uh, and, and share with people why I'm passionate about this. Um, thank you so much for taking time to do that. So um, I hope to see you all again, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.